the executive director of Town Hall Seattle. On behalf of the rest of the staff here and our friends at LA Day Book Company, it's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's in-person and virtual presentation with Rob Reich, Marin Sahami, uh, Jeremy Weinstein, and Lauren Sato. As we get underway, I want to acknowledge that our institution stands on the, on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. And we are so glad that you're back with us in person as we get begin, at least some of you are here with us in person, as we begin another season here at Town Hall. It's our 22nd. And this will be a year, I can promise you, unlike any other, uh, featuring in-person events, virtual events, and hybrid events. I don't think that needs any explanation. Uh, we're scaling up our podcast in the moment this year, which will feature exclusive interviews of authors, artists, and newsmakers by Jenny Palmer, Steve Scher, and other local correspondents. And meanwhile, many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form in our digital media library. So there are many, many ways to be a part of this place in 2021-22. Um, tonight's program will run 50 to 60 minutes, including a Q&A, to integrate our in-person and virtual audience experiences. We've changed the Q&A platform for our events. To submit your question, please enter the, meet, um, uh, enter the uh, QR code that you'll see over there, um, or uh, meet.ps forward slash big tech, uh, and you can pose your question there. We'll also drop the link into the chat and remind folks later in the audience uh, exactly how you manage the Q&A. We can't guarantee we'll get to every question, but we'll try to get to as many possible as possible. And you can do your part by keeping your question concise. Those of you who'd like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. I should have said those of you who are actually watching from a video player can avail yourself of that. Town Hall's adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming events include a look at quarantines, past and all too present. Uh, that's tomorrow night at 6, featuring authors Nicola Twilley and Jeff Maynaugh. Um, Paul Offit will examine the long and risky history of medical innovation, and the return of town hall favorite Thor Hansen, this time discussing how creatures big and small are trying to adapt to climate change. Check our website or subscribe to our e-newsletter to get the latest updates as more programs are added throughout the season. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our civics programs are supported by the Real Networks Foundation. It's a long list tonight, I'm sorry. The Real Networks Foundation, the True Brown Foundation, the Amazon Literary Partnership, the Norcliffe Foundation, the Nesholm Family Foundation, the Caffin Foundation, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. They all deserve our gratitude. Finally, Town Hall, thank you, is a member-supported organization, as many of you know, and I want to thank all of our members here in the audience tonight or watching from home. I say the word finally, and then I say the word lastly, apparently. That's on me. You'll want to dive deeper into tonight's topic, I'm sure, by picking up a copy of the book, and you'll find that conveniently located at the table over there. Um, it's an L.A. Bay Book Company table being hosted tonight by our dear friend, um, Megan Castillo. Um, and with that, we'll move on to uh, the actual introduction after all the infomercial. Rob Reich is a philosopher whose work focuses on the intersection of ethics and technology. He is the director of Stanford University's Center for Ethics in Society, co-director of the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society, and associate director of its new Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. He helped to create the global movement, hashtag Giving Tuesday, and serves as chair, excuse, excuse my fumbling, um, of its board. Uh, he's also the author of Just Giving, Why Philanthropy is Failing Democracy and How It Can Do Better. Marin Sahami was recruited to Google in its startup days and is one of the inventors of email spam filtering technology. With a background in machine learning and artificial intelligence, he returned to Stanford as a com computer science professor in 2007 and now holds the James and Eleanor Cheesebro Professorship in Engineering. As the Associate Pr Chair of Education, uh, for Education in the Computer Science Department, he helped re redesign the program's undergraduate curriculum. Marin is also a limited partner in several VC funds and serves an advisor, as an advisor to high-tech startups. Political scientist Jeremy M. Weinstein was a key staffer in the, White, in the Obama White House, where he launched um, Obama's Open Government Partnership, dedicated to the ways that new technologies might remake the relationship between governments and their citizens. When Samantha Power was appointed U.S. Ambassador to the, to the United Nations, Weinstein became her Chief of Staff and eventually her Deputy. He returned to Stanford, not Stamford, as I previously said, Stanford in 2015 as a Professor of Political Science where he now leads Stanford's Impact Labs, uh, which partners research teams with leaders in the public, private, and social sectors to Officer of Ada Developers Academy 
a super cool, that's not in the script, but it's true, an extremely cool nonprofit, cost-free coding school for women and gender expansive adults. Dedicated to creating greater economic power and agency for BIPOC women, Lauren works to find market-driven solutions to profound social problems and has spent, spent 15 years working in startups, exploring talent development, social finance, user-generated content tech, and co-working. System Error, Where Big tech, tech Went Wrong and How We Can Reboot, is the latest book by Rish, Sahami, and Weinstein, and it's the subject of their discussion. Sahami and Jeremy Weinstein. Good evening. Give us just one sec to get situated. DMAS. Get comfy. Hi, thank you all for joining us tonight and those joining us virtually as well. Um, we have what we call in our house a beefy conversation ready for you tonight. So I hope you had a good dinner, maybe got your after dinner coffee, I did. I've been looking forward to this conversation for weeks. This challenge that is presented in System Error is one that I look at in the face every, every day at Ada. And I'm so thrilled to be able to have this conversation tonight in such a robust way, both really dissecting the problem, but also finding a way forward together. Um, so you're in for a treat. Um, let's go ahead and dive in. Um, our first question tonight is for all, all of our authors. And then Jeremy, I'll start with you. Um, so system error really does take a comprehensive look at the challenges our society is facing as our technological development outpaces our ability to assess its impact. And understandably, it's a pretty bleak picture. So I was really surprised when I got on the phone with these guys, and they're all incredibly optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> so I would love to hear... Um, from each of you, what problem you're most concerned about? And then what's the source of your optimism? Jeremy, do you want to start? Well, thanks everyone for being here and, and thanks so much, Lauren, for the question. You know, I, I think as we've been teaching undergraduates at Stanford and beginning to engage professional technologists, you know, the problem that's represented in System Era that I'm most concerned about is that social effects of technologies that is, effects that go beyond the experience of any individual, but that impact our democracy or impact the nature and structure of our economy, these are things that we can no longer avoid. And while some of us might be interested in particular technologies, say what's happening in an online platform or the impact of AI on the workforce, we see this systematic pattern of social effects that seem to be unattended to, unattended to both by the companies that are developing technologies, but also by our political system that seems manifestly incapable of adapting to the moment that we're in. And so for me, that's what's at the root of system error, a sense that these effects are societal, that they're consistent in style across all of these different technologies, and that we have a political system that seems incapable of responding. So given that dire situation that I just announced, where does the optimism come from? Well, I'm an educator. And so the optimism comes from the fact that the three of us over the last four years have been engaging you know, many of the people who will make up the future of the tech industry, young computer scientists, social scientists, uh, humanists at Stanford. You know, Stanford is one of the major providers of talent to the tech ecosystem. And by creating this opportunity to engage our students and now through the book, a broader audience, um, what we see is just tremendous appetite for engaging in these conversations, a sense that the ecosystem now has not provided that space, but providing that space is absolutely essential. And I think that change is not only gonna come from Washington, in fact, it may be least likely to come from Washington, and I say that as the policy guy among the three of us, um, I think change is gonna come from workers in tech who have grown deeply dissatisfied uh, with the impact that technology is having on society and wanna see a different future for technology. I love that. Maren, do you want to 
take a stab at it? Sure. So I think to you know take that that idea and bring it to kind of a personal level. The my main concern is around AI and the impacts that it's going to have on our life. And I think already in a number of ways, AI is making decisions for us which we may or may not be aware of. So you know for a long time, if you applied for credit or you wanted to get a mortgage, the first pass that was actually making those decisions was usually a computer. Um, but now it, it's crept into more aspects of our life, right? If you think about dating and, and social life, how we get matched with people is now done more and more by algorithms. It's worked its way into the criminal justice system. Who gets out on bail and who doesn't is now determined more by algorithms. It's worked its way into healthcare in terms of what treatments you get, what you're approved for. All these things are being decided by algorithms, and there's an opacity to those algorithms. In many cases, we don't know that they're there, and secondly, even if we, don't, if we know they're there, we don't know how they're operating. Operating. And part of the problem, and this has been well documented over the last few years, is that there is bias in these algorithms. In some cases, gender bias, in some cases, racial bias, having to do with socioeconomic status, because it manifests its ways in different uh, historical data that's gathered. And then when that data goes into these algorithms that are trying to learn patterns, what they're doing is under the guise of being objective, because now it's an algorithm making the decision, what we're actually doing is reinforcing historical biases. And so that's what really concerns me, is these biases are happening, they're being built into these systems, what does it mean for us? Because it, it has the potential to just reinforce old patterns and potentially make them worse, because now AI can actually do these kinds of things at a scale that human beings could not do before. But what makes me optimistic about all this is that what generated that data, namely us as people and the kind of policies we had, um, it's not possible to look inside someone's brain and say, oh, they're actually making sexist decisions or racist decisions. But with an algorithm, you can do that. You can audit it. You can take a look at what its results are. You can actually see, is there some pattern that it's reinforcing over time? And once you can identify that, it gives you the opportunity to take steps to try to mitigate it, which is something we couldn't do with people. So I'm optimistic now that we can identify the problems, but more than that, we might actually be able to do something about them to get better societal outcomes. That's incredibly exciting. So I'm, I'm the philosopher of the lot, and um, um, I think uh, you'll excuse me then for, for pitching this as a sort of existential level of a, of a sword. Um, I think that we're exiting an era, uh, this is the problem, um, of roughly speaking 30 years of just unmitigated um, kind of initial tech optimism and then a whiplash the past five years to, to tech pessimism. And in the students that we see at Stanford, and I would imagine it's the same here in Seattle, in many respects with you know, Microsoft and Amazon and the rest of the tech ecosystem here, big tech really is Seattle and the Bay Area. Um, the students that we see have been sold a kind of unbelievably aspirational bill of goods by the tech companies, which is that unlike people of our generation when we graduated from college where going off to work for a management consulting firm or a Wall Street firm was seen to be the socially you know, high esteem thing to do, you'd make a lot of money. But no one was telling you that it was also the best thing you could do to make the world a better place. But what big tech has told the 19 and 20 year olds for the past 30 years is that you can become fabulously rich and be an incredible change agent for humanity. And what we've seen now is that whole, whole thing peel away. Um, I felt this at, you know, sort of keenly five years ago or so, just, just as we were beginning our collaboration. Um, I, I teach a first year class on, on freedom, an intro to philosophy class. And a young student on campus came to my office hours. He'd only been on campus for six weeks or so. And I was just making small talk with him to make him comfortable, ask him what he was interested in. And he said, well, I'm, I'm definitely going to major in computer science here at Stanford. Wait to meet the venture capitalists soon on campus so I can, I can pitch them my new startup idea. So I said, well, what, 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 is, your, what is your startup idea? And this 18-year-old kid looked at me completely sincerely and said, to tell you, I would have to ask you first to sign a non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> and that's when I thought to myself, oh my gosh, the socialization has been driven down all the way into high schools. Like, they're, they're already, um, you know, uh, tools of the system in a certain respect. All right, so why am I optimistic? Well, first of all, I should say my, my intellectual motto is that we have skepticism of the intellect and optimism of the will. 
We should use our intellect to figure out all the reasons why the things that we will ourselves to do will come to failure, but nevertheless, we should still try to will ourselves to succeed. And in that spirit, this will sound like a downer, but it is my source of optimism. Uh, I study democracy. Democracy is one of the oldest forms of political organization. Um, in the good old Churchill line, you know, democracy is the, the worst of all governments except for all the other alternatives. That's true. And then Churchill also has this other line about American democracy in particular, a little less well known, which is that American democratic institutions will, at the end of the day, do the right thing, but only after they've exhausted all of the other alternatives. <laughs> And I think that's the moment we're at in big tech. We've seen a 30-year period of regulatory neglect and indifference, and we're coming out of this era of tech pessimism to a more, what I would say, mature orientation. We have to harness the great benefits of the digital revolution and now mitigate the great social harms. And that's the task for the next generation of American democracy, where all of us have a role to play. Whew, thank you. That's a great start. Um, I want to dive in a little bit more specifically into the, the different pieces of what you all digest in the book and talk, Rob, specifically about that mindset of technologists yeah. that apparently now is starting in utero or wherever it's starting. Um, so no joke, I'm sitting reading this book, and on my one side, I have my husband, who's a TPM at a big tech firm. Um, and he's reading his own book called Hooked. And this is a book that's caught on like wildfire at this organization. And it's specifically aimed at teaching product man managers how to build products that are addictive, that you can't put down. All the rage. And on my other side is my son watching Minecraft YouTube videos. And I have a timer set because he would not turn it off if I didn't set that timer. So what is it about the mindset of tech so attractive and so popular? And what's at stake if we don't challenge that? Yeah. Well, so again, I was the outsider to the school of engineering, the whole computer science orientation. And one of the things I kept reading about when I would wander over to hang out with Maron at the, in the computer science department, I'd hear the language come up all the time, which is that technologists are optimizers. And so part of the key diagnosis early in the book is to say, you don't really need to understand anything about a particular technology as such. Sure, it's nice to understand algorithms or AI or data privacy, yes. But really, that is not always or not even inherently a good thing. And so in the book, we try to show all of the downsides of an optimization mindset, especially when it wanders outside of the scope of some technical application. So the YouTube people with your son, are optimizing for some type of watch time or time on the platform. The hooked book that you described is a way for the designers of the technology and the user interface to use the insights of behavioral psychology to try to addict us in various ways to optimize our engagement with something. And that optimization mindset, when it wanders um, um, outside of the realm of just one value, can often disrupt other values. In the book, we talk about Soylent, which is this meal replacement powder many of you probably know about. Soylent optimizes, it, they say, for the nutritional replacement of all food. It's, they, the founder actually says food is an inefficient delivery mechanism for the body's nutritional needs. And let's grant Soylent's inventors the idea that it might be an optimal nutritional replacement for food. If all we ever ate was Soylent to, uh, to uh, feed ourselves, we would lose all the other values of food, like cultural identity, like social sociability, um, like taste, <laughs> and to this problem. And so that's what we think one of the core problems is with the technologist optimization mindset, a kind of narrow-mindedness about the full range of values that we care about as humans. Can I, can I ask you for just maybe one counterbalance um, to offer the group? Because you had so many good counterbalances to this mindset. Can you, can you just share maybe one with the group? Uh, the upside of the optimization mindset. Yeah. Well, sure. I mean, it, in many respects, optimizing on its face seems um, so attractive because it means doing something more efficiently with less use of resources or less use of time. And um, you know, whether it's uh, creating batteries that are optimized to last longer with, at a fewer, fewer resource inputs, um, or you know, uh, our ca gasoline in cars if we're optimizing for gas mileage. That optimization mindset put to particular uses can be, can be extraordinarily powerful, and then that's what makes engineers in many respects so socially valuable. Um, but if, all, if we fall in love with optimization as such, 
as opposed to thinking about the goals or the objects we're trying to optimize, and we don't really care much about those. My boss tells me at work, I need to optimize for time on platform. Okay, I'll get to work on my A-B testing in order to figure out what little tweak to the platform will nudge up the watch time. Well, if the goal is what Facebook says of human connection or what YouTube says, actually, what is, what is YouTube's mission statement? Minecraft. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Uh, whatever it happens to be, the, the met is an imperfect proxy for these ultimate things that we genuinely care about. And that's, again, where the technologist mindset can go, can, can go a bit awry. But you're right. It has a great look, place. It's not bad as such. It's just a means to an end, and everything depends on the end that we ultimately care about. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that, that upside is what has been, made it so persistent over time right. in spite of us. I think we've been aware of the challenges for some time. Um, so, Marin, the your work in AI, I think, is incredibly interesting because AI ultimately came out of this optimization mindset, right? Like, how can we do this much more efficiently with much less human interaction? Um, and, and also for um, reasons of object, objectivity, like you mentioned earlier. Um, I, I've been re-watching Battlestar Galactica, so I apologize for that analogy in advance. Um, but, you know, maybe, maybe being afraid of the robots overthrowing humanity isn't what we should be the most afraid of. What I'm hearing from you is maybe what we should be most concerned about is the robots magnifying our shortcomings. Um, so how... How can we shift our design and engineering processes to help us alter that course um, that it seems like we're otherwise kind of on a, on, in a free fall on? Sure, it's a great question. And, you know, having two sort of tween teens who watch YouTube all the time, I will tell you that when the robotic overlords take over, they will get to watch as much YouTube as they want. <laughs> um, so they might be actually pushing for that watch out at home. Um, but I think part of the issue around AI is the, you know, thinking of human intelligence versus artificial intelligence as being something that is not complementary but is supplementary, like in the sense that you're going to substitute for human intelligence with artificial intelligence. And the interesting thing to think about, I mean, there's all kinds of articles written, both academic articles and press articles, about computers can now do X better than human beings. And so over time, we kind of get displaced from our our place in the universe in terms of things we can do well. For a long time, it was games, right? So if you remember back in the late 1990s, a computer finally beat Garry Kasparov, who was the chess champion at the time, and that made the front page of the New York Times. Well, since then, there's kind of been these other dominoes that have fallen. And some of the latest ones, for example, is thinking about AI not just displacing, say, blue collar work in a factory to be able to automate things with robots, but to displace white collar work doing things like being able to look at an X-ray now and determine whether or not cancer is present or not better than a radiologist. So in the last couple of years, this actually happened where they've you know, looked at sort of human experts versus machines and find that the machines actually in a lot of cases are slightly better. And so that brings up the danger that we're gonna displace human beings. And part of the issue is thinking about what actually happens in the medical process that's not just about diagnosis. And we can actually look at this historically. So there was a system actually built at Stanford back in the 70s called Mycin, and it was a system to diagnose blood disease. And it actually was better than world expert doctors in diagnosing blood disease. Guess how many hospitals that system's used in now, 30 years, 40 years later? Zero. And the reason why is because there's a social aspect to medicine that a human being does not want a machine telling them they have a terminal illness. Right? You want a doctor there. You want someone to hold your hand. You want someone to talk to. And so there's a whole process that goes on in, uh, in many different situations where you can think of AI can do this one sliver of a potentially better than a human being, but it's not actually a replacement of the human being in what that process looks like. So I think with the way we chart a path forward to thinking about AI is there is no doubt there are going to be some jobs that will be displaced by AI. And depending on who you talk to, there's a high variance. The figures range from about 9% to about 43% of jobs being displaced by AI in the next 10 years. So we're actually looking at near futures. 
That's going to happen. But if we think about one education policy to try to retrain some of those folks that are directly affected, but two, thinking about the processes where we take a more human-centric approach to thinking of the AI as an augment to human ability, not a replacement for it. And there's a lot of examples you can see of that. So medicine is one. Education is another big one where people talk about AI is going to replace the teacher. I don't want my kid being taught by a computer. I actually work in AI and education. I don't want my kid being taught by a computer. I want my kid being taught by a human being who understands what they're feeling and what they're going through because education is a lot more than just knowledge transmission. And that's where we need to get to with AI. Thank you. Jeremy, I, I think that we've gotten like pretty technical so far this evening. I'd love to take a step back because I imagine we have some folks here who are not engineers, who are not actively building technical products um, and in their day jobs. And I, I would appreciate it if you could decode for us what we're seeing in Washington when we see these tech CEOs sitting in, sitting in Congress day after day in these hearings and they go back to their day jobs no consequence, what, what's happening there? What's the upside of what's happening there? And what do we need to shift in order to make that more productive? So, so let's start with sort of the example that's on everyone's mind, which is an interaction between a senior senator sitting behind the dais who clearly doesn't even understand how Facebook, a platform that billions of people use around the world, make money. Right? And what that broadcasts to all of us is some profound disconnect between our political institutions that are responsible for governing a society being transformed by technology and the technologists that are running circles around our politicians. One of the things that, that we do in the book is we trace a set of historical cycles that we call the race between disruption and democracy. The, the moment that we're in now is not the first time we've encountered uh, a challenge where our political institutions are racing to catch up to innovations that are emerging in the private sector. You look at the history of the telegraph or the origins of the broader telecommunications architecture, and you have the emergence of things like extreme market concentration, right? And then the manipulation of our political system by those firms that have come to dominate these new technologies. And then you get a policy window where you get regulatory change, uh, but then that regulatory change is sticky and not adaptable over time. And so you get a next generation of technology and the regulations seem out of date. Now, in the face of those kinds of cycles, part of what you'd hear from our colleagues in Silicon Valley is democracy is not up to the task. And I, when I hear that as someone who is both a political scientist but has also served in government, let me tell you how I interpret that. I interpret that as... Let's leave these decisions in the hands of technologists. Our broader social goals in the hands of people who are building technology, corporate CEOs that are optimizing for their bottom line. And my question is, well, how's that going for us, right? And the answer is it's not going very well, right? Because ultimately we have to recognize that, that private firms serve particular goals and particular ends. And when we see societal harms that emerge like misinformation and disinformation in our information ecosystem or the displacement of work, as Maron described, as a function of automation, that impinges upon our collective goals. And the technology that we have to grapple with how to achieve our collective goals is not the private sector, it's the public sector. And ultimately, it's democracy. And democracy is the best system, you know, among all the others that we've considered, right, with all of their limits, to help us surface those competing values and perspectives and to try and arrive at solutions that help us address harms in society. We call this in the book, the guardrails approach to democracy, building on Amartya Sen's notion that if democracy is good for anything, one of the things that we've seen is that democratic countries don't have famines, right? And why is it that democratic countries don't have famines? Because famine isn't simply a function of nature, it's a function of government's failure to address accountability are much better at responding to that kind of crisis than autocracies. So we need our democracy to get into the game. But that doesn't change this weird dynamic that we saw on the dais, which is a set of political elites who really don't seem to have a handle on technology and its potential effects. And I think we have to recognize that that reality is in part of our own making, right? That is, we have built a set of democratic institutions 
We have built, we have sent people to Washington who don't understand technology. We have created a civil service system that's unbelievably rigid and that doesn't pay enough to attract people who might bring this expertise into government. And we've left our politicians in a position where they are reliant for technical expertise and advice on lobbyists paid for by tech companies. And so if we want our democracy to rally to the moment, we're gonna to have to invest in our democracy. And that means holding our politicians accountable for delivering policies and regulations that address these social harms. But it also means rebooting our democracy and getting serious about attracting tech talent into the public sector, making it much easier for people to go back and forth, creating expert capacity inside government to advise our elected officials. And, and if you ask me where are we now compared to that interaction between Senator Hatch and Mark Zuckerberg three years ago, we're already in a much better position because what we've seen in a bipartisan way in Congress is a really serious effort to investigate the social harms of tech and the beginning of this policy window that we're entering with credible regulation around data privacy, around portability of data across platforms, around thinking seriously about what renovating our conceptions of antitrust might mean. And while all of us, I think, are dismayed by the polarization in America and by the dysfunction that we see in Washington, it's pretty popular right now to be challenging the hegemony of big tech. And so I expect that we're gonna see a regulatory moment that emerges both at the state level and at the federal level in the coming years. I'm very hopeful uh, for that future. Um, and Marin, I'd love to dig in a little bit on building that next generation of technologists who will become, hopefully, our responsible politicians of the future. So when you're in the classroom with your students, what's the, what's the lesson that you really hope lands and sticks with them as they move through their careers? Hopefully into the political sphere, some of them, um, leading companies, starting new companies. What's the thing that you really want them to carry with them? I think the, the biggest lesson I want them to take away is the notion that to solve these really kind of hairy problems that we think about requires a group of people to come together that provide different perspectives. And so one of the examples we actually use very early on in the class, because a lot of students come in with this optimization mindset that Rob was talking about, or they come in from the side of political science and they don't, you know, they kind of see these engineers doing something, but they don't think about like, well, they're generating all these problems, how do we kind of grapple with them? And, and one of the examples we talk about is the notion of the nuclear arms race in the 70s, actually even before that, starting in the 50s, 60s. And the original mindset at the time was a technological mindset is how do we try to gain an upper hand in this arms race? Well, we build bigger weapons, right? We build things like the MX missiles with multiple warheads and we build a Star Wars defense system and we just keep throwing more technology at it to be technologically superior, right? We had enough weapons to sort of destroy the planet many times over. And the problem with that thinking is the only thing that building greater technology gets you is its potential use. And that's not the outcome you want. So it actually took people coming from other areas, most notably economics and game theory, to talk with technologists to sort of get to this notion of mutually assured destruction, which is based entirely in game theory, which is a different lens at looking at this problem, but understand where do you need to get to technologically where you can say, okay, both of us now have the ability to destroy each other. Let's figure out how we bring some of these other ideas to play so that we can actually maintain peace in a time when technology alone isn't going to guarantee it. That's the place where we're getting to with big tech, is the notion of understanding if we want to address these systematic societal problems, what well, we need is systematic thinking that's not just more technology or just technological solutions. It's about thinking what are the societal outcomes we want to achieve, what are the value trade-offs from the philosophical standpoint, how do we get there in terms of adjudicating the differences that people have, that's the political standpoint, and then how can we bring technology to bear to help address those problems, that's where the technologist comes in. And only when we combine those things can we get to better outcomes that we care about. That's what makes me hopeful that the students will take away. 
Ooh, I love that systems thinking. So, so let's zoom out a little bit more, Rob, and look at the broader startup ecosystem because y'all do a, a great job of, of really dissecting the, the different players in that space as well. And here in Seattle, we were lagging behind you all in terms of capital flow and, and using our, our tech wealth in order to deploy and start new organizations. Um, so if you, if you were, say, to come to Seattle and advise future investors or budding investors into this ecosystem, what... What pitfalls would you hope we avoid? What advice would you give us as we as we start to build this ecosystem here in Seattle? I think it'd be great to have Maron in this conversation too, because I'm, you know, in terms of my own background experience, as far from a venture capitalist as perhaps it comes on, on the Stanford's campus. Uh, but having observed them around me, because one of the distinctive things about the ecosystem is that the people who were the 20-year-old who a generation ago got these extraordinary technical skills and started a company are now the venture capitalists in the second chapter of their careers who then take a lectureship at Stanford in order to teach a class on the venture capital ecosystem and to get an asymmetrically early insight into the talent on campus and to strike the new deal and have the whole cycle repeat itself. Um, some non-trivial portion of the computer science faculty are themselves startup founders and investors, and the kind of revolving door between the campus, the companies, and Sand Hill Road Venture Capital um, has produced this extraordinary uh, you know, behemoth that we see before us. But I have to confess to you that one of the token over the past couple of years to people in the venture capital industry, when we try to say, don't you want to try to have a, a different orientation to how the, the, the seed money for these companies works so that rather than worry about the social and ethical consequences of the products way downstream, first just try to scale as quickly as can, um, lock in the network effects that, that happen with whatever the company's you know, first mover advantage happens to be, and then we'll worry about all the problems that come later, or you know, throw spaghetti at the wall, see what sticks, move fast and break things, all these usual mottos we hear all the time. I would have thought to myself that the venture capitalists would fancy themselves powerful players. They certainly seem like powerful players to me. But recently when we talked to them and asked, well, how can we change this ecosystem to make it work so it takes account of some of these social consequences? And they often have said things like, you're talking to the wrong people. We actually don't have much power here at all. And I've sort of furrowed my brow and tried to explain it. And the, the, the explanation on offer is at least something like, all venture capital is at the moment is a competition over the small number of people with these extraordinary ideas. And either we, we kowtow to those people and get in the game, or, or we lose out on the deal. And so the idea that a single venture capital firm or company will sort of break out of the pack and say, we're only gonna invest in companies that you know, have demonstrated to us that they have systems in place to account for the social consequences of their products is just going to make us less likely to get a deal. And I can't judge whether that's a line I'm being given or whether it's actually true. So Maron, maybe I'll kick that to you to see if you've got an insight on that. Um. I, at some level, I th think there's truth in it, but it, I do agree it kind of it, it is a cop out uh, of the problem. And maybe just to address it briefly, I think one of the things to we can actually get the founders of companies to think about is there's all these programs that are now called incubators or accelerators, right? They've been around for a while, and they try to give a lot of advice to the founders of new companies about how to scale, how to hire people, things like that. One of the things we'd like to see, which is part of the conversation we've been having, is how do we bring more of thinking about these issues around values and ethics as part of that process so that building a company is not just how do I get quick, how do I raise money, how do I get big fast, how do I hire a bunch of people, but is also how do I think about social consequences of what I'm doing, how do I mitigate the harms, and trying to build that into the DNA of the company early on before it's too late. I love that. I have a, a couple of venture studio folks who, if you're not connected with, I'd love to introduce you to because I, there's folks in that space who are really thinking about that deeply. There's a lot of systemic things, I think, that they're up against, um, including some of their co-founders and um, other managing directors. But um, yeah, that, I think that's incredibly insightful um, that that's the space. But I do want to push a little bit. Where where can venture capitalists take a more active role in, in shifting the tide here? Because that that may be what we're hearing from the venture capital folks that you've spoken with, but you do. If you talk to founders, they do feel beholden to their VCs. So what what can we shift there? 
Well, let me jump in on this, you know, because in addition to bringing the public policy mindset to this team, I bring the social scientist mindset to this team. And, uh, you know, when I hear technologists talk about products, either startup founders, people who are building things, there's this really sort of casual myth of we can't possibly know the consequences of these technologies in the world. And so we should build them, we should experiment, fail fast. This is the kind of language that you heard Rob using a second ago. And we'll, we'll iterate, we'll figure out what's happening in the world and, and we'll adjust. And, and of course, part of the argument of the book is that this pressure that's driven by venture capital, the intersection between venture capital and the technologists who are building technology, this pressure to scale, means that whatever those social consequences are, that we are acting as if they're unknowable, are felt by large numbers of people before they're made visible. And Nicole Wong, who was the former Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the United States, we had her come speak to our students a couple years ago, she's been out there calling for a slow food movement for tech, right? An orientation toward the building and testing of technology that's rooted in trying to understand and measure these consequences, consequences for individuals, consequences for groups and for communal settings before we scale technologies. Now, of course, that's what we're doing right now for self-driving cars, right? It's not that someone builds a self-driving car and we say, let's scale that to the entire United States, right? And, and see how those cars do, right, at scale before we make some judgment about whether we want that. No, no, of course what we do is we have different regulatory environments in different states. Self-driving cars are being tried on the road with oversight, with measuring of their effects, trying to understand how human behavior interacts with these systems, like the people who are sitting in the back seat watching a video, right, instead of being near the wheel where they're meant to be. And of course, then we see accidents and we see the consequences of these technologies. And so what's been missing, and you even saw Jack Dorsey sort of comment on this you know, after the most recent bout with misinformation um, and, and interference on the social media platforms was many of these companies haven't taken seriously the social and behavioral science, right? That all of these design choices, as Rob described earlier, encode a set of values, but they can also be tested and explored in real world settings before they're scaled. And I think part of the responsibility of investors in addition to startup founders is to say, I care not only about the bottom line profit, I care about the potential harms that these technologies may generate, not only for my users, but for society writ large. And I wanna go through exercises as we build the technology, figuring out what am I optimizing for? What am I potentially trading off in the process? What might be the broader social effects of what I'm building? And we need an ecosystem that values that kind of engagement. And we don't have it now. Yeah, I love that. I, I see it happening in small pockets. I see individual investors taking that approach, but we need, we need a groundswell. And I apologize, I was gonna give you a break, but I think this, this question's really important to follow up with. Um, so, and I, I'm gonna read it because I wanna make sure that I get, I get this exactly right. Um, in the last chapter of System Error, it's called, Can Democracies Rise to the Challenge? And you mentioned three opportunities for governments to play a more active role in the development of tech. They are addressing the power imbalance between companies and consumers when it comes to personal data, shifting governance from, stakeholder, from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism, and constraining the market dominance of our largest tech companies. Where are you seeing the most green shoots there? Where, where are we getting momentum and, and what, what's lagging behind? So in the last chapter, you know, part of what's motivating us in this book is a question of like, is our political system up to the challenges of the present moment? And I think there are a lot of reasons to be concerned about that and, and not just related to the regulation of big tech, right? Concerns with respect to our climate, right? Concerns with respect to the polarization that's unfolding all around us. Um, but I think, you know, the big message that, that we offer in the book is that there's no single solution to these problems. We're not gonna hit a moment of of sort of, you know, a progressive movement, moment with respect to, to the regulation of tech that in one fell swoop adopts eight pieces of legislation that will solve all these problems. Because in some sense, the argument of system error is that it's the combination of this optimization mindset 
the pressure for growth and scaling driven by venture capital, and the deliberate indifference of politicians that's given us this repetition of tech having harmful social effects. And so in order to make progress on that problem, you really need three ingredients in, in our view, and it goes a bit, a bit broader than, than, than the list that you described. The first is that we need to cultivate an ethic of responsibility in technology and among technologists. And yes, that can be done with the threat of regulatory pressure, but really it's got to come from inside industry. It's got to come from among the leading researchers in AI and in computer science, among young technologists who say, I want to be a part of an industry that embraces its social responsibilities and not just its private returns. And we see that emergence of ethical frameworks that govern all sorts of other fields. Think about the transition from quackery in medicine to organized medicine, right? With a set of ethical standards and oversight boards. You see the same thing happen with the field of law as it gets professionalized and in the field of the life sciences. And so we're on the verge, I think, of a set of conversations about the ethic of responsibility among computer scientists and technologists and we see those conversations happening. That's a green shoot. The second key component is this kind of accountability in the corporate space, right? And again, that could partly come from government, um, but a lot of what we see that's so promising right now is accountability coming from workers within tech companies. We see agency in the talented people that tech companies are voraciously trying to scoop up and recruit. And whether it's the pushback against partnerships between tech companies and the defense sector or concerns about non-disclosure agreements with respect to sexual harassment lawsuits or concerns about what people are being paid, equitable pay across gender or across racial backgrounds within companies, you see tech workers beginning to exercise their agency. Now, many people are afraid. There are people being mistreated and losing opportunities for promotion, but that groundswell of activism within companies is incredibly important. And ultimately, that kind of pressure from within is really going to matter. And then the third piece, piece is the renovation of our democracy. And the renovation of our democracy, as I said earlier, we are beginning to see those possibilities in the tech space. The kind of serious investigation of big tech companies, of their dominance of particular markets, of their efforts to scoop up or disrupt you know, the progress of, of competitor companies in ways that are blatantly unfair. These are things that are now being unearthed. And we're seeing them being unearthed through the subpoena power of Congress, but we're also seeing them being unearthed by just plain accountability journalism, like the stories that we saw in the Wall Street Journal last week about Facebook, where what's abundantly clear in those stories is that it's not that the companies don't know what harms they're causing, it's that they're explicitly aware of those harms and trading them off to maximize engagement on the platform. And so we can no longer accept at face value the now we're aware of the problem and we'll take care of it, sir, thanks so much kind of response to Congress that it's going to have to go deeper. It's going to have to be a more structural reform. And that's going to come through pressure from journalists, from accountability organizations, uh, and ultimately from politicians themselves. And the, you know, again, the reason the three of us are optimistic is that there are green shoots in all of these domains. Uh, that suggest to us that a better future is possible and that people are growing out of a perspective that what happens with tech is beyond our control, that it just washes over us like a wave and we just have to live with these great things that we get but all of these harms and that we have no choice in the matter. Yeah, that's great. I, we At Ada, we have 500 alums now, obviously very small relative to um, the folks you all are turning out, but we, we've just started to see some of this impact where we have critical masses of folks within companies. And I think in the last few years, we've had three different major technology companies drop the master-slave command language um, in, their, in, their, um, co in their lexicon because 80s, Ada graduates raised their voices together. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. There's so much hope in folks getting into companies and really advocating for change. Um, I'd love to stick on that optimistic vibe as we close out, and then we'll make sure to um, get these questions from you all. Um, if we're to leave folks tonight, you, you all offer so many great tangible ways to plug into this work, to plug into this, creating, creating a different path forward for all of us because it, this impacts every single one of us. If you were to boil it down for each of you, 
one thing? What would you want to leave folks with? Do this thing. Consider this thing. Consider engaging in this way. What would it be? You want to start? Shall I start? OK. Um, well, I guess I'm going to play to type as the philosopher, which is um, part of what I worry about most, as I said at the beginning, is that a certain type of the technologist optimization mindset has given those kinds of folks reason to be skeptical, skeptical about democracy itself, um, which is to say, it's broken in DC. They move too slow. Democracy is an inefficient way of producing the outcomes we want. If we had the technologically adept people in charge, and look, we have them in companies, we can produce better outcomes. What I, what I want to remind people of is that the, the faith that one can have in, in our actions as citizens, even though it's so often difficult to point to a kind of causal chain, well, if I vote this way, or if I engage in a nonprofit organization, or a civil society, if I make my voice heard, I can't tell what effect I'm going to have. Um, that's true all the time, and yet, it, it's what democracy's success ultimately rests upon, is that seemingly irrational thought that by making my voice heard, I can bring about with other people some collective change. And the kind of thing I say frequently to students is, if you think about the amazing revolution in social attitudes about gay marriage um, or homosexuality, um, gender fluidity that's taking place right now, um, that's a change that's happened at a pace that very few other social revolutions have taken place, and they ultimately um, have an outcome in the law. Um, that's the kind of change that I'd like to see take place amongst technologists and how they think about their work as citizens and as, as citizens working on behalf of a successful democracy. So to follow up on that, I think the, the takeaway for me is thinking about the power that individuals have. And I think the, the narrative that's often given is that you're powerless, right? That the narrative, for example, in technology is, well, you can choose to use an application or you can choose not to use an application. It puts the onus entirely on the individual and makes you feel powerless as to the person who's giving you that decision. And in fact, you have a lot more power. There's the political power that Rob talked about. There's also the power of individual people to bring issues to light that make huge, dif huge differences. And some people are really skeptical of that, and I'll just give you one example to make it clear. Susan Fowler. She worked at Uber. She wrote an article that she posted online about how the company had a sexist culture, how it was a really strange place, and how she felt like she was harassed and discriminated against. That one person and that one article brought about a sea change in the entire sector. It removed the CEO of the company. It brought about a bunch of investigations as to what was going on in terms of gender inequity and harassment in the tech sector. And this was all brought to light by one person who wanted to stand up and really make a difference and have their voice heard. And it's not the only example of things that people can do to have that kind of impact. So for tech workers, they have a huge amount of power in their company to bring issues to light, to argue for changes, and to be able to be a whistleblower if the facts mitigate that. But ultimately, you know, whether or not someone is working at a tech company, whether or not they're a student who's just starting out their career and trying to learn about these things, or as Rob said, a citizen and taking part in the democratic process, we actually have far more power than we actually think we do. You're hearing a lot of optimism from, from, from us tonight, and I think we really, we really feel it, and, and we have aspirations for what tech can be and the positive role that tech can play in society. And so just to add on to Rob and Maron, you know, for me, it, it's really important that people recognize that, that there's something called the public interest, and it's different than the private interest. And I remember a, a conversation when we began teaching undergraduates where as the political scientist coming into the room, I, I asked students in the audience, I said, sort of, what is in the public interest? And a student raised their hand and said, well, well, I'm a part of the public, so what's in my interest is the public interest. And, and for me, that encapsulates the sort of challenging moment that we're at, which is that we've lost a sense of, of the collective uh, that we're trying to, to design for in society. And you know, my hope and aspiration is that people with the skills and tools of the 21st century are not buying hook, line, and sinker 
uh, the mission statements of big tech companies that tell you you can get fabulously wealthy and make everyone better off, but instead that they recognize that, that making everyone better off, that is thinking about our collective interests as a society and in particular groups that really haven't been in a position to benefit and, and see the opportunity for upward and social mobility and the like, depends on taking that extraordinary talent and often deploying it on behalf of those very individuals and in settings that are not private sector settings, but in public sector settings. That is, that aspiration that people have to do good, we need to figure out how to harness that into our public institutions and use that not only to make our democracy work, but to make our democracy deliver for people who really need it. And the assumption that you can do that you know, in these large tech companies when the evident harms are so visible and impossible to ignore uh, has got to have been exploded by the last few years. But there is an alternative, right? There's an alternative. There's, there's ways of using technology to expand access to financial markets. There are ways of using technology uh, to figure out how we ensure that the last mile is reached for education, for healthcare, of, of closing the achievement gap. Technology can be deployed on behalf of all these important social ends. But generally, we're seeing that that's not going to happen through companies. Uh, and so we need to figure out where in the ecosystem we can generate that marriage of the 21st century toolkit with the social problems that we need to address. Yeah, I love that. And I think that there is so much space for as our entrepreneur, as our developers start to look differently than they have historically, then we start to see our entrepreneurs that look differently and they have a different set of life experiences. And so they build new products. They build products that solve problems that we didn't historically have on the table in tech before. I'm incredibly excited about that. But I wanna focus, we have a question from the audience um, and I wanna talk about how do we look at the companies that we have today and how do we better ensure a diverse and inclusive value set guides our technology going forward? Well. Uh, first of all, we should point to the organization that you're leading, Ada Developers Academy here, is a great example of one effort to try to bring it about exactly that future. And I just want to underscore what you just said as a lead into the question, which is that the, um, the reasons to try to bring about a more diverse and inclusive workforce in tech um, go far beyond the sort of ordinary fairness concerns, that it shouldn't just be a bunch of white guys who are reaping the extraordinarily we extraordinary wealth that can come from, from, from working in big tech. But as you said, it's, it's, we should get a different kind of product. We'll get different ideas about what technological solutions to develop in the first place. You know, it's easy to make jokes about some of the you know, startup companies from the past decade or two that were funded by basically 23-year-old guys um, trying to solve the problems of 23-year-old guys. I which love is, the parking ticket one. Yes, the parking ticket one where the book comes, like uh, a guy created a, a, um, a, a bot that could optimize your chance of getting out of paying a parking ticket. Why? Because as a high school student, he got a lot of parking tickets, and he wanted to try to so have a solution to this. Um, my favorite example is there's a startup in, in Silicon Valley now, I think it's called Swimp, Swimplify. It's, you know, you can sort of rent your neighbor's nice outdoor pool for a couple hours as a kind of Airbnb for a couple hours of the pool next door. Um, a problem that might be worth solving, an urgent social problem? Um, no. And uh, there are so many things that are worth throwing tech talent at that I think a far more diverse and inclusive tech sector will naturally gravitate to, rather than, you know, as Maron sometimes says, there's a disproportionate number of startup companies in Silicon Valley whose job tech companies on the, on the road, solving the problems of the tech sector. Um, okay, but if that's as aspirational as we, we have at the moment, um, count me not impressed. I appreciate that. I, my, my group of friends, there's a number of us now who are freezing our eggs. This is a conversation that's happening among women my age, especially women that are working. And my goodness, there's so much room for technology to support these women who are injecting themselves at home with very little support. Um, so yeah, I, having, being able to rent a pool sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, let's, let's go to the next one. Could there conceivably be a social science peer review process instituted in the technology ecosystem that adjudicates on innovation? Just in the group. Um, 
I think there's an extraordinary room for social science to be brought to the table in, in tech companies. We're, we're at an absolutely revolutionary movement with respect to behavioral science, our ability to learn about human behavior in systematic ways, our ability to draw inferences from large amounts of data. Um, and, and the tech sector has actually caught on to this, which is great, right? You, what? Right, exactly. But it doesn't mean that just because you have social scientists at the table, you necessarily make the right decisions. And this is why Hooked is such a perfect encapsulation of the problems that were also brought to the surface by the Wall Street Journal expose on the Facebook files last week, which is a world in which companies are more aware of harmful social effects of their products is probably not sufficiently different from the world that we're in now to generate better social outcomes. Because there's still no accountability, right? And what you saw in each of the stories in the Facebook files last week was the set of behavioral scientists communicating on the basis of experiments or the systematic analysis of data harmful effects on individuals from Instagram with respect to girls' mental health or the misuse of the platform by criminal syndicates or efforts to change something about the algorithm that actually made people angrier and you know, disagreeable with their family members and things that you could actually measure in systematic ways. The challenge is when all of these insights got pushed up to the decision-making table, people were like, well, you know, we got to trade that off against time on the platform, engagement with the product, the returns that we get from having access to people's data. Um, and so you just can't trust that, that the kind of structure that we have for these companies uh, will generate different outcomes simply on the basis of knowledge alone. Now, I don't want to argue against the production of knowledge, though, because I think part of what you saw with the Wall Street Journal expose is that the set of actors that you created within companies who had missions that were about mitigating these potential harms are dissatisfied with the failure of the company to respond, which is why all of these documents get handed over to the Wall Street Journal, and all of a sudden, you have the company needing to deal with this. Um, and so we don't exactly know what the ideal model is for generating this kind of push and pull between companies and government uh, and external accountability actors in this space. But part of moving in that direction is, is exploding that myth of unknowable consequences and acting like, well, we can't know whether these technologies are going to do harm, so let's build them and scale them up. Because I think that's reckless, and we know that we can do better than that. And so beginning to do exercises where we test these technologies, where we look, we anticipate the effects, we measure those effects, and we give ourselves a runway before we scale up new technologies, that ought to be the operating DNA of the system. Can I just add one thing to that, too? Because one other way that I would think about putting the point that comes across in the book as well is that... Um, in addition to hiring social scientists and giving everyone the responsibility of thinking about the social and ethical dimensions of the work of building a technological product, you know, one of the things we, we say as well is that the idea of having a chief ethics officer at a company is a misguided way of thinking about how to bring ethics into tech. Because it's not as if you can just outsource to the ethics expert as if it were a legal compliance function at the end of the day. What you want is from the very beginning of the product development life cycle, every single person to feel like it's their role to think about the social consequences as measured by social scientists and the ethical dimensions of the work which have to do with the trading off of values. As we build an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging system and we think to ourselves, privacy is really important. Look, we're going to technically produce a guaranteed privacy, privacy protecting way of exchanging messages, but then it also allows child pornographers to use the same system. Everyone's responsibility in the tech companies is to think, how do we balance personal safety against individual privacy? And in fact, what we argue in the book is it goes even beyond the tech company itself. It's for all of us to weigh in on those things, rather than just giving it over to the technologists if they can do a better job of weighing those trade-offs for us. Absolutely, and, and one of the, the other points that you all make in the book is around the, the need for like a technical Hippocratic oath. Yes. Um, and Marin, I, I hear the challenges in the book with instituting something like this. What do you, do you think there's legs there? Like, how can we move that forward? So I think it needs a seriousness to it that has consequences. There are actually are, uh, there's a code of ethics that the Association of Computing Machinery, which is one of the big technical societies has, the IEEE, which is if you're an electrical engineer, kind of your big 
technical society also has a code of ethics. The problem with them is that there's no teeth. There's no enforcement for violating the code, right? So if you're a lawyer or you're a doctor and you violate the ethical norms of your profession, you get disbarred or you get your license revoked. You can't practice anymore. We don't have any equivalent of that in computing. And that's part of what creates a little bit of a free for all. The people can violate the norms of the profession and they are still welcomed by the profession. In some case, they get accolades in the profession because the profession has this move fast and break things. And it's like, wow, you broke a lot of things. That's great, right? And it turns out if you break democracy or you break parts of society, that's not so great. Um, but I think the part of what it comes down to is this notion that you know people often believe that technology is neutral, right? And and technology actually creates a vector. What it does is it creates a vector of what people think is possible and what they want to pursue. So when cryptographic ledgers come along and people say, based on that, we can create cryptocurrencies. It doesn't mean that we suddenly think cryptocurrency are the product that society needs. 12 of or 120 of. They're the things that get created because the technology has created a vector and people see that's a way that potentially has revenue associated with it. AI has the same thing. And as we build out more of the kind of technological infrastructure that makes it easier to do certain kinds of things, we disadvantage other kinds of things. And so I think the takeaway there is to real self is not value neutral. It includes values about both what we do and the kinds of problems that we want to solve. And unless we really think about that, we just kind of mindlessly go into it and develop the next thing that the vector pushes us toward. I appreciate that. I want to check in with our hosts really quickly because it looks like our questions might be frozen. <laughs> do, we have, do we have some more coming in? If anybody has a question live, I'm also happy to repeat yeah, it from the stage. Live questions, exciting. Although go, we can barely see you. We're going to go off script. Here. Yeah, there's, yeah, a there's a, someone in the middle here. Yeah, just in case if everybody didn't hear, the question was about um, surfacing values and different value trade-offs within tech companies. But because many of these big tech companies are global, um, working in many different societies, um, different societies weigh values in different ways. And so how, how can the value surfacing and refereeing work in a, in a you know, global, global setting? Um, I think it's an, an essential point. And it, it, it's partly, um, in my view, related to the spirit that I think animates so much of the book, which is that we've relied upon the good intentions of a very small and unrepresentative group of people in big tech companies to make all of these decisions for us. So I just want to sign on 100% to your saying, in different countries, they're going to weigh values in slightly different ways. And the way to make that a fair process is to have people's voices represented in some broader set of decision making you know, processes or, or efforts that break out of tech companies themselves. Um, tech companies are never going to be good at representing all people's values through some type of survey of, uh, of, you know, of users. That might be a desirable input and an improvement over the status quo, but it won't be sufficient unto itself. And so again, I think the essential part is just recognizing that these products that we use, these platforms that we, we behave on or operate on, do encode a bunch of value trade-offs. And at the moment, all of those decisions are made by a small number of people. In the case of Facebook, I've been saying this recently, you know, like basically it's one guy who controls the speech environment of roughly speaking four billion people because there's only one guy in charge of making all of the decisions at Facebook. That's too much power for one person to have. I'll just, you know, full stop. And we need to find ways to break power and decision making out of the company um, because it, it, it will never get to an optimal point for all people. That, that, that's where the optimization mindset fails. We're, we're not going to get the optimal balance of everything we need in one product for four billion people. There's too much diversity in the world. One thing I'd just add to that is to say that um, you know, there's no one right answer about how to referee these value trade-offs, either internal to the United States, if you're thinking about them here, or across cultural contexts where things are valued in different ways. Um, part of the exercise that we go through with our computer science undergraduates is to say, this class isn't going to be about 
finding your way to the right answer, and we're going to give you points along the way once you've figured out how we balance privacy and personal safety, or how we balance justice and fairness and the efficiency that might come with their use of algorithms. They're going to be better or worse answers, and you're going to need to defend them. You're going to need to weigh these different uh, ideas. And so take the issue, for example, the pushback in Silicon Valley on the collaboration between major tech companies and the U.S. national security sector. There's no right answer to that question. Uh, what there is is an important conversation that needs to happen between companies and the employees that work there and more broadly in our society about these new technologies, the potential they represent, and whether the use of those technologies to, for example, have a more efficient war on terrorism is something that we are comfortable with. And people need to have visibility into that being the way that technologies are being used and be able to make choices about whether they want their talent to contribute to that, which for some people might be in the public interest and for others might be seen as something that raises human rights concerns. The same goes with respect to our tremendous platforms as they contemplate working in places like China where they might have to commit to, to abide by rules of censorship, where you could imagine the argument, it's better for us to be there and to provide some information, even if we can't provide all information, whereas others will argue we shouldn't actually you know, condone that kind of censorship. We shouldn't be a vehicle for denying people access to certain kinds of information. There's no one right answer to any of these questions. They're only debates that all of us need to have, and this puts us in a normative space, in an ethical space, and it's entirely appropriate, as we've described, for companies to have value statements. In fact, it's, it's, the, it's the ignoring of the fact that values are embedded in all of these platforms uh, and in all of these technologies that's so frustrating for all of us. We want to surface those values. We want people to be explicit about what they're choosing to do. And then people need to be held accountable for those values by people who work inside companies and people outside of companies. Thank you. Looks like we have a couple more live. Uh, we have time for one more? Okay, yeah, right in the front here. Oh, all right. There is a question, thank you for your uh, other four and eight uh, course. Oh, Very thanks. Yeah, thank thanks you. for doing that. Uh, so my question is, you know, to me it looks like it's a big problem of scale. So could a breakup of the big tech companies solve half the problem? Um, it's an excellent question, one that's being debated in Washington right now. And I think the, the answer is how you go about doing it. And maybe a good example of it actually works because we're in Seattle and Microsoft went through an antitrust case back in the, the 90s. And so the way I think about the, the Microsoft antitrust case is the most valuable thing that came out of that was not that Microsoft was broken up because it wasn't broken up, right? It was, although a judge actually you know, ruled that way in the beginning, eventually there was the consent decree, the company was not broken up. What came out of it was the fact that competitors could now exist. Part of the reason why Google exists now is because of the Microsoft antitrust case. And the reason for that is I think what it led to was it didn't break up the company, it led to a blunting of its anti-competitive practices. It blunted what it thought about in terms of acquisitions, how aggressively it went after startup companies, how much of a space it went after to dominate. And so I think when we think about antitrust in the current environment now, I don't think we're going to find a solution by saying, you know what, we're going to break up Facebook into 10 different social networking platforms. That could possibly work if we had a bunch of other stuff that went along with it, like data portability and some data privacy legislation at a federal level. So there's maybe a way to get there, but that's much more complicated. I think the thing that will actually have more impact is to blunt the kind of acquisition behavior that goes on now, right? The fact that Instagram was gobbled up by Facebook with very little scrutiny would have actually created a real competitor had Instagram existed as a separate platform. There was just a report that came out last week that talked about something like 600 acquisitions that big tech companies had made that had just flown under the radar of the FTC. Right? And so when you think about that level of basically just stopping competition before it starts, that's where part of the problem comes from. And so we have so much capital and power now concentrated in a few companies that it's hard to break that up in the traditional sense, but what we can do is blunt its behavior from quashing competitors. I think that's actually where we'll, you know, in the next 10 years, we'll, we'll really see the effect. And I think it's just important to add, add one thing to what, what Marilyn said, which is that 
you know, the emergence of concentrated power in big tech and the, the advent of anti-competitive practices that have really enabled dominance across multiple markets, not even just the original market that these companies oper operate in, um, is, is partly the result of a deliberate removal of our democratic politics from the regulation of big tech. That is an explicit decision was made in the 1990s to craft a regulatory oasis around the information superhighway and to create space for technology to emerge. And we can weigh in retrospect the, the pros and cons of having made that decision, but we haven't even begun to see the potential of regulation to kind of blunt some of these practices. And even some of the debates that are happening in Washington right now are how could you actually resource the Federal Trade Commission or the Federal Communications Commission to carry out the kind of regulatory oversight that's envisioned. You need the political will, but also the resources. And they're talking about how do you turn the FTC into something that actually has teeth? Well, it starts with actually having staff and having resources. And if you have starved your core regulatory agencies of the resources that they need to track what's happening in the technology sector, and then you add to that the total absence of political will for action, that's why we're in the position that we're in. And I think when we say we need to energize ourselves as citizens, it's partly to push back against the complacency that we've seen in our politics with respect to these problems as they've emerged. It's not that we haven't been aware of these problems, but in fact, our politics has contributed to the emergence of these problems. Our elected politicians have been asleep at the wheel. That's changing, but we need to hold them accountable, not just Mark Zuckerberg accountable, not just the CEOs of these companies, but when it comes to social effects, elected politicians for mitigating these harms is something that's in our hands to address. Well, I'm feeling energized, and it's past my bedtime, so. <laughs> Appreciate it. Rob, Marin, Jeremy, thank you so much for coming to Seattle live so in the flesh with us. Thanks to all of you for Thanks coming. So much. Thanks very much. We dove in pretty deep on some of the topics in the book tonight, but I promise you it's just scratching the surface. This is definitely a must read. I recommend picking it up. Thank you, Lauren, for, for all the wonderful questions and moderation. And thanks to all of you who came out tonight. It's a treat to see people in person. We're really <laughs> grateful for that. Thanks.